conservation laws uh, with a primary focus on angular momentum, as that is the newest thing. First problem, two balls of mass M are affixed to the ends of lightweight rods, one rod of length R1 and the other length R2, with R2 equals two-thirds R1. So I'm going to write that down so we remember it. R2 is two-thirds R1, and I'll draw the picture here. So we have a ball here, and that is length R2. And a ball here, and this is length R1. Let's make it look like R2 really is shorter. And what's going to happen is R1 is going to come down, and these guys are lined up. So that when that's horizontal and that's horizontal, these balls will exactly bounce off of each other. Good. Both rods rotate around a vertical axis so that the gravitational potential energy of each ball remains constant. In other words, we are looking down on this. This is on the plane. And then these rods are lifted off so that the ball's not rubbing against anything and there's no friction. The, the rod of length R1 starts rotating in the direction shown with angular velocity omega 1. After the two balls collide elastically, what is the angular velocity of both rods? Is angular momentum conserved in the system? If not, what are the external torques that break it? Well, okay. So we're going to have an elastic collision. And this one, I'm going to cheat a little bit here. Um, and I'll explain what I'm cheating on. What's going to happen in the collision here, I'll draw this just the instant before the collision. All right, that guy's horizontal, that guy is horizontal. So here's, what I'm, here's the cheating bit. In reality, this rod where it's attached could exert a force that way or that way against this ball. If it couldn't, then it would be impossible to get the ball uh, to change the way it rotates, right? Um, the ball just, if, you know, by you grab this rod and turn it, the ball's going to move. And so therefore, the rod has to be able to exert a sideways force on the, on the ball. Now I'm about to pretend it can't by saying that, oh, this rod is only going to pull directly back. Now there is a way to get out of this, and that is instead of a rod, you make this a string and have this string stretched right to its length. Now, of course, it won't support it, so it has to be resting on the surface, but then you can say it's a completely frictionless surface. Okay, fine. And so in the case of a string, the string really doesn't exert any sideways force. You try it, you, you turn the string, and it'll just kind of twist up the string and pull the ball in a little bit. The force can only be along that direction. So if we say it's a string instead of a rod, then yes, the force can only be that way, can only be that way on this rod. So what will happen is this ball's coming in the instant before the collision, right? The ball always moves tangential to the circle. This guy will be moving here with some speed, which I will call V1i. All right. Both these balls have mass m. They're going to collide elastically, so mechanical energy is going to be conserved in the system. There's no external forces doing work. Yeah, there's an external force that way. There's an ex well, in fact, if we just consider the balls the system and we ignore the strings for a moment, yes, there's an external force that way, there's an external force that way, but at this moment, everything's moving vertically. So they don't do any work at this instant, in the instant of the collision, because they're perpendicular to the direction of motion. All right? And there's no friction. So there's no external forces doing work. Because it's an elastic collision, nothing's being converted into um, heat. So we have energy conservation. And we also have momentum conservation, because the external forces now, once we've turned these rods into strings, so they can't exert any sideways forces, are along, let's, let's call this the x direction. right? and not along the y direction, so we have momentum conservation in the y direction. So for this collision, what we can do is we can, fig we can figure out that um, PIY has to equal PFY. All right? And so after the collision, you're going to have this guy. Let's assume he bounces off. I think I'd probably say he does. And this guy is going to be going at VF2. This is going to be VF1. You know what, let's be consistent. V1F, V2F. So PIY is minus MV1Y, right? Because I've defined V1Y as going down that way. PFY, because I've drawn V1F this way, V1F is the plus Y component of the final velocity of that one. So that's going to be M. Instead of V1Y, this should have been V1I, right? Because that's this. MV1F. And then here I have defined V2F to be that way. So V2F actually is the negative of the Y component. So what I'm saying is, is that V2F vector is equal to 0, comma, minus V2F, comma, 0. 
that's what I, by drawing this that way, that's how I've defined this. And the magnitude of V2F is really the absolute value of V2F if it turns out that this guy, I mean, it won't. But if it turns out that that guy is going that way, all right, so normally I would use V2F as the magnitude of this. The point is it's possible that V2F will be the negative of the magnitude. So that's what that vector is. So what that means is, is that I add in a minus M, and the two M's are the same, minus M, V2F there. That's good. And I also have the initial kinetic energy has to equal the final kinetic energy, because there's no change in potential energy, and we've argued that mechanical energy is conserved. So that says that 1 half m v one i squared is equal to 1 half m v one f squared plus 1 half m v two f squared, not minus, right, because it's just 1 half times m times the speed squared speed. So it's always going to be a positive. Kinetic energy is always positive. Great, and so now we have two equations and two unknowns, v1f and v2f, so we can find this. This is We've actually done this exact thing before. I'm going to start by dividing this whole momentum equation by m. So I have negative v1i is equal to v1f minus v2f, or minus v1i minus v1f is equal to minus v2f. I subtracted v1f from both sides multiply both sides by negative 1, and I get V2F is V1I plus V1F. And that was exciting. Take the kinetic energy equation, um, multiply both sides by 2, divide both sides by M, and the kinetic energy equation becomes V1I squared is equal to V1F squared plus V2F squared. Right, that's what I get by, you divide by M, all the M's go away, multiply by 2, all the 2's go away, you get this. Now I'm going to plug this into here. So I know V2F in terms of these, that'll get rid of the V2F's, I can find V1F from that. So V1I squared is equal to, um, you know, well, uh, I'll go ahead and do it this way. I actually know that this is, I'm going to, I'm, I'm hitting, cruising for a quadratic formula, but you know, we can cope is equal to V1F squared plus, and then V2F is V1I plus V1F quantity squared. So I have to multiply that out. V1F squared plus V1I squared plus 2V1I V1F plus V1F squared. Right? If I did that right, yes. And that's V1I squared on the left, so I don't think I actually will have a quadratic formula. Maybe I will. I'll see in a moment. I can subtract those out, and I have 2v1f, so 0. I subtracted v1i squared from both sides, squared, plus 2v1i v1f. So I'm going to divide the whole thing by 2 and factor a v1f out. I have v1f times v1f um, plus v1i. Okay, so this is good. For this to be zero, there's two ways to make this zero. Either V1F is itself zero, or V1F has to equal minus V1I. If V1F is minus V1I, then this plus this will be zero. Either one of these, right? or V1F equals minus V1I. So let's think about what that means. I foolishly erased it, so I'm gonna have to draw the F situation again. So that was how we defined V2F. And this is how we define V1F. So if V1F is minus V, that was a 1 there, 1I, one what that means is V1F is negative, which means it's actually going that way. So now this is something that's, this is why usually when I do this, I will define all velocities in the same direction. Notice I defined V1F positive is that way. So if V1F is negative, it's that way, which means it's the same direction as V1I. So what this really says is, V1 vector doesn't change. Right now, it looks weird because it looks like, oh no, it's the negative of before, but that's because I defined V1F in this direction. That's where that negative sign comes in. So this says V1 doesn't change. That would be the case of them not you know, missing. What if this is a ghost and it just goes right through and doesn't actually collide? Because ghosts have mass. So um, this is not the interesting solution. This is actually the interesting solution, V1F equals 0. And if V1F equals 0, then V2F is equal to V1I. Right? That's our interesting solution. So what that means is, I'm going to erase all of the algebra now here. 
V1F equals zero. That's what happens when they actually collide. And this, we've actually worked this out before, so maybe you remember it. Am I actually recording? Yes. So I'm going to erase all this. And we know that what happens after the collision, um, this guy ends up at rest. And this guy ends up, it's going like that, but his speed initially is the same, V1i. He still has a speed that way. That's like that. So now, what the actual question was, first of all, um, the route of length R1 starts rotating in direction shown with angular velocity omega 1. So I don't even know V1i, but I can find it easily. Right, that's omega 1. Well, so that says this point is a distance R1 from the thing we're rotating around. Right, I called that V1i. So we know that V1i is equal to omega 1 times R1 because R1 is the distance from here to the thing that is going at speed V and also is going at angular speed omega around. So we know that. So therefore, we know that here, this V1f is going to equal omega 1 R1. But what is this omega 2 here? Well, it's not the same because omega 2, that's R2. So I know here that omega 2 has to equal this V1i times R2, right? Because R2 is the distance from this omega is around, it pivots around this point, from the thing it's rotating around to the thing that's moving at speed V1i, which is this ball. That's R2. So that's how you get this V1i and the omega that goes with it. But we know that V1i is equal to omega 2. I did this wrong. It's not V1i R2. It's V1i over R2. I just had it the wrong way around. And we know that V1i is equal to omega 1 R1. So it's R2. So omega 2 is actually equal to, and then um, R1 over R2 is 3 halves. Right. If I, if I solve this, divide both sides by R2, and multiply both sides by 3 halves, I get R1 over R2 equals 3 halves. So omega 2 is 3 halves omega 1. So after the collision, this guy is not rotating. This guy's rotating at a higher angular velocity. Now, is after the two balls collide, what is the angular velocity of both rods? I've got that. Is angular momentum conserved in this system? Clearly, no. How do I know this? Well, let's just think about it. Let's, now here, to talk about angular momentum conservation, I measured my omegas around two different points. To talk about angular momentum conservation, you have to pick one point to measure it about. Let's pick this point. So the initial angular momentum was just going to be uh, m times r1 squared times omega1, because the moment of inertia of a point going around is mr squared. So that was before the collision. That's not I. That's the angular momentum. After the collision, let's think about it. It starts with this, which is the same, because it's m r1 squared is v1i, right? or whatever. It's the same thing. But as this guy goes around, at some point, it's going to be moving in this direction. And whereas at this point, the direction of the angular momentum, remember, L is r cross p of a point mass moving. So r was that way, p is that way. So the angular momentum here is into the board. But now, after the collision, and this guy has rotated around to here, r is that way, p is that way. Angular momentum is now out of the board. So I don't even have to calculate magnitudes. The direction has changed. So clearly, angular momentum is not conserved. It actually is conserved in the collision, but it's not conserved in the system as a whole. Why not? Where's my external torque? Well, here it is. This thing here nailed into the ground. As this guy goes around, it's always exerting a force towards the center. I'm just sort of drawing all over myself here, right? It's always exerting a force. This rod is always exerting a force on the ball to keep it going in the circle. And so therefore, the nail has to be exerting a force on the rod Otherwise, the rod, you know, the, the, the Newton's third law of the ball on the rod would pull the rod out, and the ball would actually just go like that. So the nail has to be exerting a force on the rod to keep the rod and the ball together towards the center. So there's, there's always a force in here. 
And because the lever arm from here to here, right, this is the point we're measuring angular momentum about, there's a lever arm, often these forces are not parallel or anti-parallel. So there's an external torque there, which as this guy goes around, keeps chain continuously changing the angular momentum. So angular momentum is not conserved in this system, and that's where the external torque is, right? We had fixed two different places to the ground. Pick one of them to measure angular momentum around, and so there's going to be no torques from those forces because there's no lever arm, but you will have a lever arm to these. So if they're not exactly in the right direction, you'll get external torques. Anyway, that's the first problem. The second problem is looking five billion years into the future. So the sun currently rotates once about every 26 days. At the end of its life, five billion years from now, the sun will have shed the outer 40% of its mass, and the remaining mass will collapse onto a white dwarf star, which has a radius of only 9,000 kilometers. Which you say, you say only 9,000 kilometers? How can you say such a thing? Well, let's just, for context, I have the mass of the sun and the radius of the sun here. Radius of the white dwarf is 9,000 kilometers, which is nine times 10 to the three kilometers. So if I convert to meters, that's 9.0 times 10 to the sixth meters. Notice 10 to the eighth versus 10 to the sixth, it's a factor of 100 smaller. That's why I say only, because it's a lot smaller than the sun used to be. Um, I've left out a whole bunch of stages of the sun will be a red giant and fun things will happen. But what we're interested in is you have the sun now with its current radius and its current mass, and it's rotating with some omega now, which we'll figure out. It's not very hard. And then we're going to have the sun later, which now it has the white dwarf radius, and it has a mass that's 0.6 times the mass of the sun. And it's going to be spinning with some final omega. And what I want to do is figure out how fast the white dwarf is rotating. I'm actually after the period. Well, OK. The first thing, though, is that this, it's not all of this. I mean, the 40% of the sun that is in the outer part is actually going to be radiated away, uh, or not radiated away, sloughed off, blown out, and it will take its angular momentum with us. So we don't actually want to consider the, the full angular momentum of the sun with us, with it. We want to consider the angular momentum of the sun of the inner 60% of the sun's mass. So how do you figure that out? Well, we're going to make the foolish, foolish assumption that the sun is a uniform sphere, which it's really not. We get the angular momentum wrong by, a, by a, something like a factor of 10 by doing this, but all right, we're, we're going to go with it for now. And I want to figure out what I'm going to call Ri, such that this mass here is 0.6 times the mass of the sun. How do I figure that out? Well, if I'm assuming it's a uniform sphere, that means the density is the same everywhere. So what that means is that if you want 0.6 of the mass of the sun in here, this has to be 0.6 of the volume. So the volume of the sun right now is 4 thirds pi times the radius of the sun cubed. And I want 0.6, which is otherwise known as 3 fifths, right, that's 0.6, has to equal 4 thirds pi times ri cubed. Okay, well we can do that. Divide both sides by pi. This 3 cancels this 3. Divide both sides by 4, and what I get is 3 fifths times r sun cubed is equal to r i cubed, or r i is equal to 3 fifths to the 1 third times r sun. So I don't know how to do 3 fifths to the 1 third in my head. I'm, I'm trying and I'm failing, so I'm going to use a calculator. So 3 fifths to the 1 third turns out to be about 0.84. I'm sure that's very illuminating. And uh, what you get when you multiply that by the radius of the sun, here I get my ri, it's 5.866, keeping too many digits, 5.866 times 10 to the eighth meters, right? Now, again, that is way too big because um, the sun is really much denser here, so you could have a much smaller sphere to contain 60% of the sun's mass. But again, we're ignoring that, and we'll deal with at the end how bad this makes our life. Good, so now I have a new Ri. Now this omega, well, I, what I really have is the period. So I know that this omega is equal to two pi divided by 26 days, which is equal to 0.242 
days to the minus one. Now you say, wait, I thought omega had to be in seconds to the minus one. Well, no, it just has to be in a time unit to the minus one. I'm going to keep it in days just for now. Maybe we'll convert later. We shall see. So good. So that's the initial omega. And now the assumption we're making is that this outer part of the sun, which is going to get lost, all the angular momentum it has it will take with it, this inner part of the sun, which collapses down and becomes this much smaller white dwarf. This is not to scale, right? This should be 1 100th the size of this, and clearly it's not in radius. I've drawn this too big. So our initial angular momentum is in that direction, is equal to the initial i times uh, initial omega, right? Which I have here. It's just that I dished bow. We'll just call it omega because that's what I call it. Has to equal i f times omega f. Well, it's a sphere. So the initial i is going to be 2 fifths times 3 fifths the mass of the sun, right? Because that's the initial mass is only 60% the mass of the sun, so I have to keep that, times ri squared. I'm just going to leave mass of the sun there for reasons that you'll see in a moment, times omega. Has to equal i f. That's going to be 2 fifths times three-fifths the mass of the sun, because that's the mass of this white dwarf now. But now it's got radius of the white dwarf squared times omega f. That's the final angular momentum. Now here's why I never plugged in the mass of the sun. Hey, look, it divides out. In fact, the three-fifths divides out, and the two-fifths divides out. And I'm left with ri squared omega is equal to radius of the white dwarf squared omega f, or omega f is equal to ri divided by r white dwarf squared omega. Well, now here I'm going to do a thing. What I really ask for in the question is, what's the final period? And I know that the period, well, I know that omega is equal to 2 pi over the period, right? Because this is radians per second, and the period is defined as how long does it take to go through 2 pi radians. So 2 pi radians divided by t seconds gives you omega. Yay. So that also tells us that t is equal to 2 pi over omega. So knowing that, I'm going to take 2 pi over both sides of this. So I have 2 pi over omega f, which is equal to the tf I want, is equal to, I have to do 2 pi divided by this whole thing. So when I divide by ri over rwd, that will effectively flip this fraction. It becomes rwd over ri squared. I have the 2 pi, and I divide it by omega. And hey, look, I never even needed to calculate that omega. I have rwd over ri squared times the initial period. That is tf. So now we can calculate this. So I'm going to put in the numbers. The radius of the white dwarf is 9.0 times 10 to the 6 meters. I have to divide by the ri, which is 5.866, keeping extra digits and intermediate numbers times 10 to the 8 meters. And then t is 26 days. You can see that it's going to be a lot smaller already because I'm dividing 10 to the 6 by 10 to the 8. Let's put this into the calculator. We'll have to square it off here. But when I put that into the calculator, I get 0 0.0061 days. Yikes. And so now that's something you might want to convert to hours, minutes, or seconds. So let's do that. So if you convert that, that comes out to like 8.8 .8 minutes. Right? So, oh my god, how did the rest of the board get erased? You didn't see me. That's a little scary. Okay, I'm just not going to worry about it. So we started with the sun like this, going around once every uh, 26 days. And it ends up with this little white dwarf going around once every eight, I'll just say nine minutes, round it to one digit here. Now, there is the question. In fact, you know, we said Li, and really, of course, we took the moment of inertia of this inner 60% of the mass of the sun. We said Li, which was Ii, uh, Ri, was equal to Lf, which is I of the white dwarf times the... Uh, Oh, what do you mean I, I, V, I, 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 omega, times I, white dwarf, omega, white dwarf. Now, the one we used here was too big by at least 
10x, which means that the L we calculated was too big by at least 10x. Now, the I word white dwarf he used was also too big, but it wasn't too big by as big a factor. I would have to actually sit down and calculate it. Sorry, I'm not going to do that for you right now. So if this was also too big by 10x, then this and this would exactly balance and the omega would be right. But as it is, this is not by big, too big by as big a factor, so we know that this is too big by something less than 10x. But not a whole lot less than 10x, like maybe it's 5x too big or something. It might even be too, 10x too big. So that says that if the omega is too big, then the period is too small, right? The faster the angular velocity, the, the less the period. That was spastic. So really, instead of eight minutes, this might be like 80 minutes, an hour and a half, but still, this guy's rotating a whole lot faster than the sun is right now. And that's what happens when you take big mass, all rotating, and condense it down into little mass, all rotating. It's like the ice skater in space. That was problem number two. In the third problem, we have a wheel that's composed of a ring of mass M and three rods, each of mass, same capital M, like this. So this radius here is R, little r. This is M. Each one of these rods, there's three of them, is mass M, and their length is D, which is 2.5 R. First question, what is the moment of inertia of this wheel? Oh, that sounds painful, let's just not do it. No, let's do it. Okay, so first, um, if you have a composite object, the total moment of inertia is just the sum of the pieces. So we know that the moment of inertia is going to be the moment of inertia of the ring plus three times the moment of inertia of one of these rods, because the rods are all basically the same. They're all rods of length D and mass capital M rotating around their center. So the I of the ring is just capital M times little r squared. It's the mass of the ring times the radius of the ring squared. And the moment of inertia of the rod is going to be 1 12th, because it's rotating around the center, times capital M, the mass of one of the rods, times the length of one of the rods squared. But we can simplify this. First, I'm going to pull a capital M out front. We have an r squared, 3 twelfths is 1 fourth. And then D is 2.5 r squared. Now, this is a mistake I see some of you make sometimes. When you have things multiplied squared, that's the same as m r squared plus 1 fourth. That's the same as 2.5 squared times r squared. Right? So now I can pull out the r squares, and I have 1 fourth plus, now what is 2.5 squared? Well, put it in a calculator somewhere, but here's the thing. 2.5 uh, do I regret my life? I think I probably do. 2.5 is also known as 5 halves, right? Did I do it right? 2, 4, 5. Yes, that's right. 2.5 is 5 halves. Um, so 2.5 squared is going to equal 25 fourths, right? So I'm going to have 1 fourth plus, um, I lied, it's 1 plus 1 fourth times 25 fourths. I factored out the r squared, so that's equal to m r squared times 1 plus 25 over 16 is equal to m r squared times 16 plus 25 over 16. And you're thinking, why don't you just keep it as a decimal? It's like, ah, eh, this will be a little cleaner. 16 plus 25 is 41 sixteenths. Wow. So, 41 sixteenths capital M R squared is the moment of inertia of this whole thing, assuming that I've done that right. 16 plus 25, 35 plus 6, 41. Yes. So we now know that the moment of inertia of this wheel is 41 sixteenths capital M R squared, where capital M is the mass of the ring as well as the mass of each of the three rods. Yay. Now notice, so, so the total mass of this wheel is 4M. 16, 41 over 16 is um, a little bit less than 3, right? Because 16 times 2 would be, uh, uh, I could totally do this, a little less than 2, because 16 times 2 is 32. It's a little less than 3. 16 times 3 is 48. 
was a little less than three. So had the whole thing been a ring of radius r, it would have been 4m, it's mass times r squared. But it's less than that. That's because a lot of the mass is closer to the center than radius r here. So we know the moment of inertia of this guy now. That's also part a. Also, we will need it. Second question. Which of momentum, angular momentum, and energy are conserved in this collision? Which collision? I didn't read you the whole problem. Um, now what we're going to do is, so we will keep track that this here is 1.25r, right? Because it was 2.5r for the whole thing, so half of it is 1.25r. A ball is going to come in of mass little m and speed v. It's going to come in, and then after, let me get rid of this up here, after we have the wheel again, only now it's rotating at some thing omega, and the ball has bounced off at some speed vf. I assert that it is an elastic collision, so the ball bounces off of this piece of the rod sticking out here. It's an elastic collision. So now we need to think which of momentum, angular momentum, and energy are conserved. So let's start with momentum. And the question you ask for momentum is, are there any external forces in the directions we care about? Well, okay, this wheel is fixed in place. So what that means is there's going to be a normal force if we zoom in on the axle of the wheel, right? Here's the wheel, and there's probably some axle that's in here. When the ball bounces up here, the axle is going to push back that way with a normal force to keep the wheel from sliding off that way, right? The ball during the collision, the ball exerts a force that way on the wheel, so there'll have to be a balancing force this way. And the faster the collision, meaning the less delta t for the momentum transfer, the bigger the force of the ball up here, so therefore the bigger, bigger this normal force, that means that um, there is an external force. We don't even have momentary um, isolation because this external force could get pretty big to balance this force here, but this, this axle here is not part of our system. So momentum is not conserved because we have the external force of this normal force. That means momentum is being transferred somewhere outside the system, the earth, or wherever the wheel is nailed to. Let's do angular momentum next. Well, all right. So here, the only external forces we have, I mean, we might have gravity if, if this is vertical. I didn't actually tell you if this was vertical or if this is horizontal. If we have gravity, then that's a problem. So really, this wheel will have to come in like this, bounce off, and go off, off something like that. But we still have momentary isolation, because gravity is what it is. And if the delta t gets smaller, the total impulse from gravity, which is just mg delta t, gets smaller. So even if there's gravity in that direction, we have momentary isolation um, during this collision. So let's think about the other external forces we have. The only other external forces are the gravity of the wheel, which is that way if it's down. Or actually, if we think that this wheel is horizontal, there's not even gravity on this. Gravity's that way. So we don't even have any forces in this direction. Um, but there is maybe going to be this normal force I talked about before, so that when that hits there, there's a normal force pushing that way on the axle of the wheel, which could be a problem. But for torques, if we measure angular momentum about the center of the wheel, which we probably ought to, because that's what we just calculated the moment of inertia for. If we make a measure angular momentum around the center of the wheel, any force at the center of the wheel has no lever arm, and so therefore will exert no torque. So there's no torque from any of these forces. We have momentary isolation for gravity, or this thing is horizontal, and it doesn't matter. So there are no external torques, at least momentarily. So we do have angular momentum conservation in the collision. And finally, let's think about energy. Well, we know that in the collision itself, it's an elastic collision. So that says the energy will be conserved in the collision between here and this part, between the ball and this part of the wheel. So no energy is converted to heat that way. Do we have any external forces that do work? The answer is no. Um, right. Just before and just after, the, the ball's moving this way. So if gravity is that way, it's perpendicular, so it's not doing work. The center of the wheel doesn't move, so any forces there don't do work. So we do have energy conservation. So here's one where we don't have momentum, but we do have angular momentum and energy conservation. So we can use that in order to figure out um, 
the, uh, the stuff we want to know. So let's see if we can write down these conservation equations. So for angular momentum, we have Li is equal to Lf, and what I'm going to do is define x, y, z, and we'll just look at the z components of uh, angular momentum. So if I just draw, here's the center of the wheel, here's the ball coming in, right? So this would be R of the ball, that's V of the ball, is to the left. So R cross V is in, the, is in the plus Z direction, hey, yay. So all that's left is to figure out its magnitude. So the magnitude of the initial, and there is no momentum in anything other than the ball. And so there's no angular momentum in anything other than the ball. It's just going to be this RB crossed with V. And so therefore its magnitude, Li, is going to be RV, RB, sorry, RB crossed with P, really, which is mrb cross v because p is mv, right? So I took the m out of the momentum there. So it's going to be mrb v sine of what? Sine of that angle theta I just drew. But now notice here that this length, which is equal to 1.25r, right? or if you don't like that, let's call it 5 fourths r. Same thing. 5 fourths r is that length is equal to rb sine theta, because it's this, you know, we've got a little right triangle going here. So opposite over hypotenuse is sine theta. So this is equal to m times v times 5 fourths r. That is the initial angular momentum. And that's in the z direction, because we concluded it's all in the z direction. The final angular momentum, now we have two things. So first of all, the wheel is rotating this way, so its angular momentum is going to be in the z direction. So we're going to have an i omega, which I'm going to write as 41 sixteenths capital M r squared omega. Now we have this guy, he's moving in the opposite direction. So if I draw the little r again here, Right, the displacement crossed with the momentum is now into the board, so that's a negative z contribution to angular momentum. It's going to be exactly the same analysis as over here, so I can say minus mvf times 5 fourths r. Right, because, the, again, the perpendicular component, which will come in from that sine theta, is still going to be 5 fourths r, because it's half of d. And that's where I got this 1.25r from, because this whole length is 2.5r, so half of it is 1.25r. Good. So this, here is our, so I'm going to say this has to be equal to Li, has to equal little m times v times 5 fourths r. And that's very exciting because now we have one of the two equations. The other equation is conservation of energy. So the initial energy is 1 half little mv squared. And the final energy is 1 half capital I which I'm going to go ahead and substitute in, 41 over 16 capital M R squared, that's I omega squared plus, not minus, plus 1 half little m V F squared. So this is our other equation. We have two equations, the two unknowns are omega and VF, so we should be able to do the algebra to solve these. So let's see if we can do that. This algebra will be a little bit ugly, but we can do it. So now that we've got the thing set up, I'm just going to erase the board so I have the full board. Remember that picture? I have the full board to do algebra on. And I'm just going to copy the equations up to here. Wow, I had so many pens and there's none left up here. So I have 41 over 16 capital M R squared omega minus little m V F times 5 fourths R is equal to M V times 5 fourths R. There's one equation and the other one I had is 1 half little mv squared is equal to 41 over 32. What I did is I took 2 times 16 is 32. m r squared omega squared plus 1 half little m v f squared. So two equations, I've just copied them up there. Two equations, two unknowns, we should be able to solve it. So let's do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say which one do we want to get first? Let's get, by the way, 
you might have been tempted to say something like this, that Vf is equal to omega times 5 fourths r. And that would be very wrong, right? If we had a V equals omega r relationship here, I just do too many spokes. Um, like suppose with this little r here, the speed of this point on the wheel, if that's omega, the speed of that point on the wheel, v pow, is going to equal omega times a little r. But that's not something we care about. That is not at all the speed either that the ball came in or the ball that the ball went out. So we don't have any v equals omega r type relationship we can use here to make our life easier. So omega is just an unknown. So we'll keep it like that. So which one do we want to find first, which is going to turn out to be nicer? I don't know. So let's guess that finding omega first will be nicer. So what I want to do is solve this for vf so that I can get rid of the vf. So if I want to solve this for vf, I'm going to add, uh, I want to move the omega to the other side. So I have a minus little m vf times 5 fourths is equal to mv, 5 fourths r, left out r out, mv times 5 fourths r minus 41 over 16, capital M, r squared omega. Now, what can we do to simplify this to start off? Well, if I multiply the whole thing by 4, this, six, this 41 sixteenths become 41 fourths. If I divide the whole thing by r, those two r's go in this r squared becomes just r. So to make sure I'm keeping track of myself, I'm going to rewrite what I have after those two operations. So I have 5mvf minus 5mvf is equal to uh, 5mv minus 41 fourths capital M R omega. So now what I need to do is divide both sides by minus 5m. So Vf is equal to minus V, because the 5m goes off there, minus, when I divide by 5, I'll have a 4 times 5 in the denominator. And this minus becomes a plus, because I'm divided by negative 5. 41 twentieths capital M over little m r omega. So that's what Vf is. Eh, that's a little ugly. But what I'm going to do is substitute that in here. So I pull this equation down. I have 1 half m v squared is 41 30 seconds, capital M r squared omega squared, plus 1 half m. And now I have 41 twentieths capital M over little m, r omega, plus, not plus, that's an r, not a plus, r minus v. So I've substituted this in for vf and it's squared, and this is where you start to win saying, oh, do I really have to square that out? Yes, yes you do. So let's, it'll be exciting, right? Everyone will have fun. Um, good. So I still have 1 half mv squared on the left is equal to 41 over 32 capital M r squared omega plus 1 half m. And here it comes. What is 41 squared? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write 41 as 40 plus 1 squared. So that's going to be 40 squared plus 2 times 40 plus 1 squared. So 40 squared is 1,600 plus 80 plus 1, so that's going to be 1681 is 41 squared. So that's 1681 divided by 400, capital M squared over little m squared, r squared, right? Wince, everybody. Wince, omega squared, minus 41 over 10. That's because the, uh, the cross term has a this times this plus that times that, so it'll be two of them. So I multiply by 2, I get 41 tenths, capital M over m r omega v plus v squared. Oh, that felt relaxing after the others. Okay. Okay, good. Well, all right. It's not as bad as it looks, but it's close. So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have one half m v squared is equal to 41 over 32, capital M r squared omega, plus 1681 over 800, oh yes, living the dream, m, that should have been m squared there, 
So really, I'm left with capital M squared over little m, r squared omega squared, minus 41 over 20, capital M r omega v, plus 1 half m v squared. Subtract 1 half m v squared from both sides, and it gets a whole lot nicer. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to erase this up here. I'm going to draw a line to separate my columns. And I'm going to continue the algebra up here, and I will continue it in red for deep epistemological reasons. So 0, I'm just going to copy this equation, is 41. 0 is 41 over 32, capital M r squared omega, plus 1681 over 800, capital M squared over little m, r squared omega squared, minus 41 over 20, capital M r omega v. Well, okay, so there's a thing we can do here. We can divide the whole thing by 41, because remember, 1681 is 41 squared. So that becomes 1, that becomes 41, that becomes 1. We can multiply the whole thing by 4, because 32 multiplied by 4, that will become an 8. This will become a 200. This will become a 5. You can divide the whole thing by capital M. M squared becomes N. N. You can divide the whole thing by R. So this R squared becomes R. This R squared becomes... I'm feeling distress. I lost. This, see, this was omega squared, so this should have been omega squared. So that should have been omega squared, so this should have been omega squared. All right, so I'm dividing by R. So that R squared becomes R, that R squared becomes R, and that just goes away. All right, so it's a little better than it used to be. So it's 1 eighth R omega plus 41 two hundredths capital M over little m r, that was omega squared, I keep doing that, omega squared, minus one fifth v omega. And now I can do the thing. So I'm going to do the thing. I'm going to factor out an omega. So I have an omega times, and I'm going to combine some stuff together, one eighth r plus 41 over 200, um, capital M over M R, times omega minus one fifth V. So we have two solutions here. One is omega equals zero. That's where the wheel's not rotating at the end. That's not interesting. The other solution is one eighth R plus 41 over 200, capital M over little m R omega is equal to one fifth V. All right, let's see if we can simplify this a little bit. Unfortunately, eight does not divide evenly into 200, so we're gonna to have to weep openly. So the common denominator, the minibida, huba, common denominator is this, we're gonna to have to go up to 400. So, um, I'm gonna to have to multiply this by two to get that to 400, and then 400 divided by eight is 50. Did I do that right? Yes, it sure is. So I will have 50 plus 82, oh, I won't even, because there's an M too. I'll have 50 little m plus 82 big M over 400, oh, the horror, um, 400 little m times R omega is equal to one over five V. But here's the neat thing, if I multiply both things by five, the 400 becomes, I can totally do this, 80. So I am left with omega, right, doesn't this sound painful? Omega is equal to V times 80 little m over 50 little m plus 82 big m divided by R. So the units are right. I've got V over R, and then this is a mass divided by mass. And I can actually simplify it a wee bit more. So I get V over R times 40 M, right? Because I can multiply by one half over one half, divided by 25 little M plus 41 big M. And that is the final omega, right? That wasn't so bad, right? And here's the key. The algebra was a little bit ugly, but can you set up 
these things is the most important part. If you can set up these things, then doing the algebra is kind of a, you know, you turn the crank in a sense. But anyway, so that's what you get for omega. Let's go ahead and figure out what VF is. It's going to be this. So to find VF, I will have minus V plus all of that. So 41 over 20 big M over little m times R times V over R times 40 little m over 25 little m plus 41 big M. So the R's cancel. This M will cancel that M. This 20 goes to 1. That goes to 2. So I will have minus V plus 41 times 2. Can I cancel anything else? I don't think so. I'm going to factor a V out front. 41 times 2 is 82. I still have all this stuff with a capital M divided by 25 little m plus 41 big M. Now I have to common denominatorize. So that's going to be little v times, I have to just stick this denominator here, minus 25 little m minus 41 big M plus 82 big M divided by 25 little m plus 41 big M, having common denominatorized. 82 minus 41 is still 41, so it's going to be 41 big M minus 25 little m divided by 41 big m plus 25 little m is times v, of course, is vf. So that is the speed it bounces off to the right, which means if 25 little m is bigger than 41 big m, which means a big, big ball, right, so that little m is bigger than 41 over 20 fifths, which is a little less than 2. So if this ball is a little less than twice the mass of the wheel, it actually, instead of bouncing back, will continue forward as the wheel rotates around. So that's the VF you get. Anyway, so there's a bunch of algebra in that. Get the thing set up. The hard part, really, the physics part, is figuring out which things are conserved, and then correctly setting up these equations, and then the rest was doing the algebra. So that is the third problem, and that is it for this set of conservation laws. I hope it was illuminating. Thank <laughs> you.